Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the CSH, the Centre de Sciences Humaines. We are delighted to welcome Professor Mahesh Rangrajan this evening. As many of you would know, Professor Rangrajan is Professor of, of Environmental Studies and History at Ashoka University. He is the head of the Department of Environmental Studies, as well as the chair of the Ashoka Archives of Contemporary India. Prior to this, Professor Rangrajan has been the Vice Chancellor of Korea University, as well as the Director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. He also taught at Delhi University and was visiting faculty at Cornell University, Jadavpur University, as well as at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. Mahesh is one of India's prime figures in the field of environmental history. This is a fast expanding field of history which recognizes that non-human life forms are historical actors too and that they play a critical part in the evolution of human societies. Mahesh has authored a number of acclaimed books. Let me cite Fencing the Forest, which was published in 1996, India's Wildlife History in 2001, Nature and Nation in 2015, and most recently, Towards Coexistence, People, Parks, and Wildlife, which he co-authored with Basant Sabarwal and Ashish Kuthari. Mahesh also edited and co-edited a long list of important volumes, including most recently, At Nature's Edge, Global History and the Long-Term Possible. His authority in the field is well established. This explains why he was recently recognized by the American Historical Association as a honorary foreign member of the association. Prior to this, he was also appointed as the chair of the Elephant Task Force of the Government of India in 2010, and was a member of the Forest Advisory Committee of the Ministry of Environment. His presentation today is based on new research for his upcoming book and would be titled, How the Tiger Became Indian and Why? Ecology, Society and Culture in India, 1972 to 2022. But before we proceed, I would like to introduce his discussant. This evening, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Divya Bhanu Singh Chavda, who's a renowned wildlife expert, nature conservationist, researcher, and author. Dr. Divya Bhanu Singh is well recognized for his pioneering research on the history of the Asiatic cheetah and Asiatic lion. Let me cite his well acclaimed books, so The End of a Train, The Cheetah in India in 1995, The Story of Asia's Lions in 2005, and more recently, a book on the rhinoceroses entitled The Story of India's Unicorns, which he co-authored with Dr. Ashok Das and Dr. Shivani Bhus. As a well-established expert in the field of wildlife conservation, Dr. Divya Bhanu Singh was appointed on multiple high-powered committees and boards constituted by the union and state governments. Among these, he, was, he held the directorship of the UP State Tourism Development Corporation and was most recently a member of the National Wildlife Action Plan Committee. He also served in various organizations of international repute, working in the field of wildlife and nature conservation, including the World Wildlife Fund and the Corbett Foundation. So again, I would like to thank Dr. Divya Bhavn Singh Chavda and Professor Mahesh Rangrajan for joining us this evening. Let me remind you the title of this presentation, How the Tiger Became Indian and Why Ecology, Society and Culture in India, 1972 to 2022. such as the IUCN, Pantera and others, international organizations, reputed ones, that the tiger is on the front, at the center of their optimism, which is somewhat in contrast with general environmental gloom on a range of issues, is the rebound of tiger numbers in South Asia, not only India, but also Nepal, to some extent Bhutan, and the continuing efforts in Bangladesh. There's also, over the last 50 years, uh, been a substantial turnaround in attitudes to the tiger in a very important country, which is quite significant in the history of the tiger, China, and a collapse and a revival of its fortunes in another important country, Russia. By contrast, across Indochina, the countries which France, of course, had a lot to do with at one time, Vietnam, but also one would like to add Laos, Cambodia, the species seem extinct. One of the reasons why the tiger survived the 20th century 
there are many, is that in the late 1960s and early 70s, as my title seems to say, the tiger became Indian. This is not a discovery I made. Uh, Professor Paul Greeno wrote a very interesting paper in which he looked at interventions of the state vis-a-vis -vis ecology. He made a very interesting observation that in 72, 73, 74, the same country which was mobilizing efforts, energy, resources, public opinion, goodwill to save one species and its associated fellow fauna and flora, the tiger, was also celebrating, organizing with resources, time, energy, and money, the extermination of another species. That was uh, around the time the Panthera tigris, tigris, the then nominate subspecies of the Bengal tiger, came to be called the Indian tiger. So Greeno tells us that before the 1972 tiger task force, the tiger was normally referred to in documents as the Bengal tiger. As you all are aware in Bengal, West Bengal in India, 1972 was the year of birth of very important new state in Asia, Bangladesh. In those areas, it is still called the Royal Bengal Tiger. There's a tale which I am happy to go into later. But the tiger becoming Indian was also part of a uh, political transformation. And uh, at the press conference, when he was asked why the tiger was uh, being made the national animal, Dr. Karan Singh, uh, full confession, he was my chairman when I was at the Nehru Memorial Museum. And I asked him jokingly one day that, how did you feel that lion displaced the tiger, given your surname Singh means lion? And whether it was true that uh, the tiger was chosen because his nickname, as his many biographies attest, was tiger. And he, of course, strenuously denied it. And he guided me to the press conference where he stated that the tiger has been chosen, these are his words, because it's a symbol of unity in diversity. The tiger, he said, is found in 11 of 16 states of India. And Indians will unite to save the tiger as part of our natural heritage. The lion, he rightly said, is found in one state in India, and it has been declared the state animal, and we are committed to protecting the lion. As you perhaps might have guessed, the other species which India and the world were celebrating the extermination of was smallpox. And therefore, in the early 1970s, late 60s, we see a much deeper involvement of government with ecology. And to understand why, as with all such stories, one has to go back a few decades, at least a decade. Any talk about the tiger, anywhere or not, would be incomplete without reference to the man who made his fortune because of the tiger, writing books about it, Jim Corbett. And there's a fascinating conversation Jim Corbett described in the book Viceroy at Bay. Now, this is the Viceroy is Wavell, and the writer is Wavell's son, Lenderman. And many uh, authors have referred to this book for various reasons. It's based on Wavell's diaries. Wavell was one of the viceroys who did something very important. He went out on a hunt. And he was sitting on a machan, waiting for the tiger to come. And there was some time to talk. And he asked Cobbett, what do you think will happen to the tiger when we leave? And Wavell says, Cobbett said that he gave it a maximum of 10 years. Now, the reason for this, according to Cobbett, was that once every peasant had the vote, the axe would be used to chop down the trees. The game would be hunted out. And the forests would be turned into cultivation. This, of course, was a statement made while Wavell was Viceroy, and Wavell was to give him his full title of Field Marshal. He was Lord Archibald Wavell. He was a man of the forces. And this is the time Britain was engaged in a battle for survival because the Second World War was raging across Europe, Africa, and, of course, Asia. It came to India's doorstep, the battles of Kohima and Imphal. And uh, during the war, there's a very important uh, set of uh, transformations we should not lose sight of. Uh, one of them is that the war necessitated enormous mobilization of resources. So the Grow More Food campaign um, saw a very important change in the attitude to distributing guns to the peasantry. So the crop protection, Grow More Food involved giving out guns to the peasantry. Now, those of you who would recall, and we can't help but recalling can be, is that after the crushing of 1857-58, 1870 Arms Act, most sections of Indians were not allowed access to guns. This was eased in the war not to fight enemies, but to fight the hoofed animals and ungulates, wild boars, nilgai, pigs, which might raid the crops. The other great change, of course, with the war was the coming of a very important insecticide, DDT. In his book, uh, India's War, Srinath Raghavan, it's a very interesting book, and uh, many things about it are interesting. To me, what's in most interesting is, I didn't know this, the first aerial spraying of DDT was done on what was then called King's Bay, later renamed Rajpat, and now called Kartavyapat. And it was sprayed over on the soldiers who were camping in the tents because there was a fear about lice and pigs and you know, soldiers falling ill. 
And DDT became popular, of course, in its powdered form. And in the aftermath of the war, DDT became available, um, uh, dissolved in uh, 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 petrol, and therefore it could be used as an insecticide. So many of the destructive changes unleashed by the Second World War, the felling of trees, the opening up of areas for agriculture, the use of uh, weapons for hunting, they were not just used to, crop, to protect crops, they were also used for hunting, and an easing of restrictions where there were restrictions on um, game hunting and for protection of fauna. All of this became de rigueur in the years after independence. One of the very interesting works uh, written in 1964 was E.P. Gee's Wildlife of India. E.P. Gee was a tea planter who stayed on, and he has a fascinating account of how in the post-47 uh, period, there was an increase in hunting. One reason, of course, is the dry cell battery came in. You see, you could uh, put a torch and the animal would be frozen and you could shoot it. The other is because uh, one of the consequences of the war is that though the soldiers went back, they left their jeeps. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen those old jeeps. It had something called a starter. You had to poke this metal thing. In. But, but those jeeps were four-wheel drives. And this was also a time of enormous political and social turmoil, particularly in North India, both in the West and East. We are in Delhi, a city which was, uh, whose cultural life was both renewed and transformed by the arrival of refugees. And many refugees headed to the area known as the Tarai. The Tarai is a belt of grassland which begins in West UP, extends through Nepal and Bhutan, right up to Assam. And if you see late 19th century accounts such as Baldwin, the Tarai was renowned as the finest ground of the tiger. Right into the late 19th century, it had the rhinoceros, swamp deer, hog deer, sheep, and large numbers of tigers. And the Tarai resisted land colonization because it had malaria and mosquitoes. Also, because there was no one willing to drain and settle that land. All that changed. And uh, very fine works of Billy Arjan Singh of Kapurthala, who later became a conservationist, uh, give us a sense of the extent of that land clearance. So this is a time of very major rapid transformations of land utilization. And one of the transformations was also that early independent India decided, like many other countries, to give priority not only to political independence, securing its independence from various military blocs and alliances, but also to supplement the political with its concomitant economic independence. So if one thinks of the large dams of modern India, Tunga Bhadra would be one. They were often built in areas of scrub jungle and forest. But there were also other such uh, pro projects and programs. So if you look at the pulp and paper industry, large areas were opened up. So there is a renewed assault, if you like, on the natural world. This has been uh, very well uh, documented and written about in a remarkable book by Anne Grodson Gold. I'd love to talk more, but this talk is about tigers, but I can't resist talking about wild boars. Where uh, in the Ghatiali Raj of Savar, she was told by the elders she interviewed in the 90s, most of these people are dead now. And Bhujuram Gujar and she were told that they remembered the time of the Rajas and the princes as a time of intense pain and pleasure. Pleasure because they could travel in these large areas of commons and even into the Raja's estates and gather berries and nuts and fruits and uh, uh, some lops and tops. But pain because the great sounders of wild boar came and attacked them. And I think we need to keep in mind that the tiger did get a measure of protection in pre-1947 India. It got a measure of protection, interestingly, from those who hunted it. And many of the rulers who amassed large bags for tigers, one can name just a few, Maharaja of Riva, uh, Madhav Maharaja of uh, Gwalia, these are bags of 700, 500. Every time I say this, people get a shock. But, uh, you know, the record was uh, to be held in post-independent India by Ramanuth Saran Singh of Sarkuja, 1,157. And for those interested, he also shot 2,000 panthers. Now, we must remember this is a time when shooting was regarded as a mark of masculinity, manliness, it was an assertion of power. And uh, hunting brought the princes much closer to the British. The British also had large bags. And when India becomes independent, it's important to remember, the princes retained their privy purses. Many of these hunting reserves continued. You have just been viewing, I'm sure, last few weeks, you know, the ceremonies around death of Queen Elizabeth II. So Queen Elizabeth visited Nepal. And we now know that in Nepal she shot a tiger, though at the time it was put out that the chap sitting next to her shot it. But her, her husband uh, was not so bashful. In 1961, he went to Jaipur and he shot a tiger in Savai Madhapur, uh, which is now the Ranthambo Tiger Reserve. He visited it again in 1981, but this time to view it. And here lies the tale of the tiger. By the late 1960s, there is a very important shift and a change. There are many reasons for this. Uh, Valmik Thapar, who has been a very important conservationist photographer, 
and more importantly, Jairam Ramesh in a very well-documented book, Indira, Life in Nature, give a central role, of course, to Mrs. Indira Gandhi, who becomes prime minister in 1966. And in 1969, she gave a very important uh, talk here in this very city, International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, which was held in the Vigyan Bhavan, which is, I think, you know, stone's throw from where we are uh, today on, uh, in the CSH, in which she said that the uh, we do need foreign exchange, but not at the cost of some of the most beautiful four-footed and feathered inhabitants of our land. And she went on to describe the magnificent tiger, the majestic elephant, and the mighty rhinoceros as animals that face the threat of extinction. In another speech, she also said that she was against a narrow accountant's point of view, which wanted to squeeze the last rupee out of our forests. I've always wondered where the second phrase came from. If you uh, go through Jairam Ramesh's book, one of the books she had read when it came out was Silent Spring by Rachel Castle. The copy is still there in the Nehru Memorial Library in the corridor where Nehru's books are, read, are kept. I don't know if Nehru read it. Carson used exactly this phrase. She said that the companies which make the chemical pesticides, uh, they embody technology and an attitude which will earn a dollar at any cost, a dollar at any price. So I think there is a, a, a element of an economic critique as well present in this. This was especially true in a year like 69. Uh, around this time, the director of Delhi Zoo, Kailash Sankla, did a study and he got the Nehru Fellowship and he wrote it up. And he showed that in many places where hunting licenses had been given, the hunters were unable to find tigers to shoot. The Bombay Natural History Society also conducted a nationwide survey of the tiger with somewhat similar techniques, looking at hunting records, interviewing forest officers. By now, there was also a very important book by George Schaller, 1964, George Schaller comes to India, already very famous. He had studied the gorilla. He had written a book about the gorilla, which was a bestseller. He changed our image of the gorilla. It turns out to be a somewhat peaceable ape, not a killer creature in the forests of Rwanda. And Shala tried to give a sense of the relationship of the predator and prey in Central India. But I think the late 1960s was concern about wildlife, but it was more than wildlife for itself. I want to enter here a very interesting exhibit, which I have only recently come across. You know, we are now celebrating the 80th birthday of very famous hero, Amitabh Bachchan. And he became famous because he had a hit film called Zanjeer, which for those who know Hindustani means, you know, the handcuffs or chain. But uh, Zanjeer had a very important character called Sher Khan. And Sher Khan is a person who can be hired as a killer. And there is a very interesting scene where two men come and tell him that we want someone to be finished. And they give him the money. And he says, Samaj lo kaam ho gaya. Unka naam kya hai? Uh, consider the work done. What is the name? And when they tell him the name, the inspector who is his friend, he says, you fools, don't you realize he is a Khan. He's a sher. And Sher Khan does not hunt shares. Sher Khan Sher ka shikar nahi karta hai. Sarkar ne bhi ab elan kar diya hai ki Sher ka shikar band karna hai. Mulk mein bohut kam Sher reh gaya hai. Government has said you should not kill the tigers because there are very few in our country. So I think in the late 60s to early 70s, the tiger becomes a symbol of something it never was in the past. You know, all these mass hunts for the tiger, I referred to various princes, one could give a long list of British officers. They were accompanied from 1870s to 1920s by large rewards for killing of tigers. Uh, roughly in that period, 1,600 tigers were being killed every year for rewards. There were rewards for male, for female, and yes, there were rewards for male cubs and female cubs. And uh, this process of giving out rewards was continuing in some parts of independent India. It continued, for instance, the Sundarbans right up to 1972. In an aside, in 1969, there's a fascinating paper that where there were, you know, uh, bunds and uh, dams being built, check dams, and there were small ponds, there were fishing contracts. The fishing contractor could also take out what is called a crocodile contract. That is, just as they caught fish to sell, they could catch and kill crocodiles. But for these crocodiles, they would be given a reward by government. Now, how would you decide how much reward to give to the crocodile? Simple bureaucratic solution. You measured the crocodile. The longer the crocodile, the bigger the reward. So this is a very interesting moment in India where the wild, in this case the crocodile, or the tiger, or the forest, is seen 
as something which has to be tamed, civilized, transformed, so that the nation can develop. This is a very interesting moment, so interesting that one of the most fascinating characters in Indian politics, Vidya Charan Shukla, uh, in the 1969 IUC and Gendered Assembly, it is in the minutes, he's not identified there, but he has later said he did say it, and he has said it on record elsewhere. He said he was very worried about the proposal to ban sport hunting of tigers. Sport hunting could be banned all very well, but each tiger, he said, does great service for the country because every time it's shot, the country earns 40,000 rupees of foreign exchange. So there is a very interesting transformation taking place. In 66, when Mrs. Gandhi came to power, she came in at a time when there had been two successive droughts. Now in this 100 years of 20th century, there have been only three times when the rains, the main monsoon, southwest monsoon failed twice. It was her luck that she came in when they'd failed a second time. And India, as you all know, was highly dependent on American wheat at the time. Uh, in two years, it purchased 19 million tons of wheat for which it did not have the foreign exchange to pay. At the same time, there was an accelerated push for the mix of measures known to historians as the Green Revolution. Now, I can't get into the Green Revolution in detail, but to put it in one line, the core of the Green Revolution was an attempt to create food self-reliance for the nation state by intensively encouraging production in certain select areas with high levels of imports. I would argue Project Tiger 1972 is a final equivalent of the Green Revolution. The difference is that here, nature would itself enable its recovery. So there would be no equivalent of pesticides, fertilizers, high yielding varieties, pumped up water and tractors. That wouldn't be there. And the 1972 Tiger Task Force, interestingly, had two key members. One was M.K. Ranjit Singh, very active, very alive with energy, which uh, makes people half his age seem that he's half their age. And uh, he was a very interesting figure to choose. He was himself a reformed shikari. He was an IAS officer. He had served in Madhya Pradesh and been involved along with a very enterprising uh, officer who would go on to be Project Tiger Director in uh, the Kanha National Park, where they had also relocated a village called Somf. There was Kailash Sankhala, the director of Delhi Zoo, a very different figure. Sankhala in his memoir and elsewhere would recount how he was horrified when he joined the Forest Service to learn that before he became a divisional forest officer, he would have to earn his spurs by shooting a tiger. In his memoir, he says something which would be politically incorrect in more, for more reasons than one, so I'm saying it very carefully in quotes. MD Chaturvedi said, I want you young foresters to be fine young men. When you get married, don't ask your in-laws for jewelry and money, get a gun. And remember, no man is fit to be a divisional forest officer until he has shot a tiger. And Sankhla in his book, written much later, uh, you know, he describes his deep agony and uh, shame when he shot dead a tiger from a machan and he vowed never to shoot again. Now, I don't know what Sankhla felt at that time. We have just managed to get hold of his diaries and field notes in our archive. I'm yet to look at them. But I think it's a very interesting moment of transformation where the tiger is becoming an honorary citizen. Remember her words? The furred and feathered animals are inhabitants of our land. It's a very interesting clue to this, given by an unusual figure, the tiger biologist, Dr. Ullas Karat. In 2000, he wrote a very interesting piece called Making Space for Nature in uh, the Hindu Sunday magazine. Now, Ullas Karanth, uh, we have to give him due, also happens to be the son of the great Shivaram Karanth. And recently, along with the two, the, his two sisters, he has written a beautiful book, Growing Up Karanth. I'm saying this for a reason. Ullas Karanth argued that the drive against spot hunters, poachers, timber smugglers, shikar outfitters, and to protect the natural heritage actually was a concomitant of Mrs. Gandhi's leftward turn in 1969 when she nationalized banks, abolished the privy purses of the princes, and in 1970 did something, this is my words, not his, no leader in Indian history has done. She promised to abolish poverty, Garibi Hatao. And that this particular drive to protect fauna and flora actually was a way of reclaiming nature for the public good. And I think there's something very deep here, which is why I quoted uh, Pran in Zanjeev. And uh, it's very significant that if you go back in time, in 1899, the American sanskritist 
Hopkins wrote a book called The India Old and New, which had a fascinating afterword. It was called Famine in India, Its Causes and Cure. And Hopkins argued that the tiger was a major reason that India had been saved. He said that the tiger, by keeping control of not only the deer but the cattle, protected the forest, which kept the monsoon cycle intact. Now, Hopkins, of course, was an Indologist. He was quoting a very famous phrase from the Mahabharata. There is a famous uh, scene in which, you know, Duryodhana mocks the Pandavas because Krishna has come to the court. And uh, it is Duryodhana who says, uh, Shivani Bose, uh, uh, Divyaji's co-author, has uh, given us the translation. Duryodhana says, as the tiger guards the forest, so the forest guards the tiger. This is not ecology. It's the Kauravas for the tiger and the forest is the kingdom of the Kurus. But just to note, the reply given by Krishna is the tiger may be in the forest, but the lion will kill the tiger, meaning the Pandavas will destroy you. But to come back in the late 1960s, the legitimacy of Project Tiger and the legitimacy of the Wildlife Protection Act and the Forest Conservation Act 1980 was in still a largely agrarian society. No, the India of 1970 was very different from India of 2020. Three out of four Indians lived in villages. Three-fourths of the traction power, 70% of the traction power came from cattle. This was still a society where the failure of the monsoon meant very serious economic privation for a very large number of people. You know, the Viceroy Executive Council member, 1906, I think, who said Indian budget is a gamble in the monsoon. Definitely, it sound, looked like that in 66, 67, 68. So the legitimation of the tiger conservation doesn't come only about tigers. It becomes a symbol of a renewal of the land and the water cycle. This is particularly significant because of the way in which Project Tiger soon moved from being a species-centric program, save the tiger, to the idea that the tiger would be, they don't use the term umbrella or flagship. These come much later in conservation literature. They talk about the tiger as an index of environmental quality. And in the first press conference, Kailash Sankla, he was a man with great flair, he said that the policy of Project Tiger is to do nothing and not let anybody do anything. And he clarified that he wanted each of the nine tiger reserves, which were in eight of the 16 states, tiger rain states, that they would have a core area where commercial forestry would be stopped. Human extraction of faunal, floral wealth, mining, etc., would not happen and nature would take its own course. That was the second part. We do nothing and not let anybody do anything. The other point which is crucial is that Unlike in the past, when certain select areas had been selected as hunting reserves, Sabai Madhapur, Bandipur, and others, this time the net was spread wider. And even if we look at the early debates on Project Tiger, they considered several habitats. The main stumbling block was that a state had to forego the forestry revenues of that core area. Now, some of these are states uh, are forests which were very important as reserved forests for timber. We think of Bandipur, uh, later Mudumalai in uh, uh, Tamil Nadu. Kanha, of course, in the case of um, Madhya Pradesh. So it's a foregoing of revenue by the states is something of great significance. Of course, it helped that Mrs. Gandhi in 1972, 71 had won the general elections, Garibi Hatao, remember? 1972, the state assemblies were dissolved, except for Tamil Nadu. Almost all the major states were under the Congress. And therefore, whether it was legislative or executive power, there's an enormous centralization. The dislocation and displacement of villages actually would unfold mostly during the emergency, a period of about 18 months in which civil rights and democratic liberties were suspended. And it is important that around this time, Mrs. Gandhi herself, who had been a critic of neo-Malthusian rhetoric, for instance, in 72 in the Stockholm conference, embraced it. And in 77, it's a very important moment in Indian democracy. There is a removal of one government coming of another government, peaceful transition of power. We've had so many since then, we don't realize how historic that was. There are very few Asian African countries where it happened so peacefully and easily. But equally important is that in 1978, we are still discussing the tiger, aren't we? There was a first international symposium on the tiger. It was inaugurated by no other than Deputy Prime Minister Jagjivan Ram. 
remarkable man. He could have given the tiger lessons in survival. He had become a minister for the first time in 1946, and he remained one up to 1979 with only two breaks in between. He had held all the major ministries, and at very crucial times, he had been minister of agriculture and forests. So his awareness of the subject was deep. And in 78, he explained that Project Tiger was a national project. It was not a project of a party or an individual. And he did something politicians like to do. He promised that our aim now is to create a white tiger national park in Bandavgad, where there'll be lots of white tigers. He'd obviously not been told they are mutants and you can't have so many white tigers with four things they won't be able to hunt successfully. Really. So I think there's a very interesting transformation. And to me, I think the tiger becoming Indian is not only important in terms of unity and diversity. It is a transition from a species-centric notion where you wipe out species slash slave species to an idea of ecosystem protection. One small evidence of this would be that in these reserves and after Wildlife Protection Act, the wild dog, which had been made a uh, vermin for which till 1972, you turned in the tail of the wild dog, the tahsildar or the forest officer would give you some money. That stopped. And I think these are very significant transformations. So from the end of 60s to end of 80s, protected areas in India go up tenfold. There's never been such growth ever again. Today, there are 5 to 6% of the land area. Post-Project Tiger, they start even looking at, you know, Sankla himself, when he stepped down as Project Tiger director, went back to Rajasthan, he sets up the Desert National Park. Now, in 1977, to think of protecting the desert, which was regarded as wasteland, where there were various, you know, fauna and flora, is itself a very significant step. But I think it's significant that by 1983, 10 years into Project Tiger, the director actually goes to an IUCN conference and he writes a paper called Project Tiger, 10 years on, what to do when you have succeeded. He answered it, more of the same. More reserves, more protection. 10 years later, the picture is very different. In the early 90s, there's a major poaching crisis. Uh, there is a transformation of the behavior of tigers in many of these areas. And of all the tiger habitats, places like Shivpuri, Bandavgarh, uh, Rantambo are very interesting because these are dry open scrub forests. And many of them have, we should remember, artificial water bodies. You know that ideas in nature is untouched, they are not untouched. The water bodies of Rantambo are a result of very innovative check banks, check dams built by the rulers there. They built it for all sorts of reasons, the areas got abandoned. And in these areas, tigers started coming out in the day. And the tigers of Rantambo may or may not have written the natural history of the tiger. Remember, George Shalai had already done that in the 60s, hadn't he? But they rewrote the photogenic history of the tiger. So for the first time, you get tigers with names in public. Noor and uh, Jangez. And, you know, there's a whole book called Portrait of a Predator. How this tiger, Jangez, evolved new methods of hunting. But how do you know that? Because someone's watching him in a jeep. And this is very significant. And, you know, the idea of the tiger dropping its nocturnal cloak and coming out is also happening with several other animals. Again, it's significant that in the 90s, it's precisely some of these areas where a lot of tigers would be poached. And there's a major debate in the 90s, again in 2005, when tigers become extinct in Sariska and Panna, how far the poaching is driven by internal demand, how far it is driven by the Chinese bone trade. So there's a transformation of Asia and Asians and a transformation of consumption patterns. But there is another side to the debate. Scholars like Karanth have long argued that it's not only poaching. You also have to look at the ability of the habitats to support the recruitment of new generations of tigers. So to bore you for a minute, 30 odd years of work by Karanth and others, 40 odd year, years of work in, by the Smithsonian and other teams in uh, Nepal, a tiger would require about 50 deer a year. A self-respecting tigress with cubs, remember she does this mostly on her own, would require 80 deer a year. So if you're going to have a population of tigers or tigresses, you need at least 500 equivalent of deer or 800 equivalent of deer. Now, this is actually somewhat easier than it sounds in South Asia than if you were up in Manchuria or Northern China, because the level of biomass available here in terms of herbage and forage is high. There's sunshine through the year, there's rainfall, and the ability of this vast array of ungulates to convert that into hoofed meat for the tiger is remarkable. So we start having a lot of debate about how you count tigers. So in 1972, it was done by the system of pug marks. So anyone here, it's uh, slightly outdated. In the old days, you went and gave your thumb imprint, originally pioneered by IPS, Imperial Police Service officer in the 1900s. 
applied interestingly to tigers in the 1970s. Saroj Raj Chaudhary wrote a famous article, Tiger Tracer, and he showed, in fact, he had a pen kept next to the tiger's bug bark and how you measure it. So they roam around putting all these uh, sand in various places, making plaster casts. So by the 80s and 90s, there's a lot of criticism of this. You may be able to check thumb imprints, but is it really possible to check tiger footprints? Is it possible that you count five tigers where there's one or two tigers where there are five? And uh, following a lot of these criticisms, particularly in 2005, government brought about a lot of changes. There's a new tiger task force. The most interesting thing about this tiger task force for me is that perhaps for the first time, second time in its history, a woman played a very important role in the tiger. The first, of course, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. The second was Chairperson Sunita Narayan. Now, this Tiger Task Force comes up with three, four very interesting observations. One is, they say we're going to change the way we count our tigers. And the new methods of tigers photographing themselves, uh, photo cameras which are remote, and then you count the number of stripes. At that time, they had to sit and count it. Now, there are very complicated computer programs. These come to be used. And you get a figure, again, this, you know, these figures are very interesting. In 1972, when they said India has 1,827 tigers, please note, 1,827. This time they said 1,446, I think. These figures capture the imagination. There were 40,000 tigers in 1900. There are only 1,827 now. There were 1,827 when Project Tiger was about to begin. There are only 1,400 now. Similarly, now, uh, 2018 figure comes to nearly 3,000. So, the total number of tigers has doubled. So, please note how a metric of a number of a vertebrate has become so crucial in environmental quality. I'll come to this later. But second, along with changing the method of counting, uh, this is an interesting committee. It included the ecologist Madhav Gadgil, veteran forester Pavar, uh, veteran IS officer Samar Singh, and Valmik Thapa. Valmik Thapa disagreed with many of its uh, provisions, but he might have agreed with one of them, which is they supported the notion that there would be areas which would be human settlement free. What they did say is that the manner in which people had been displaced, relocated was unjust, that uh, there should be a minimum of 1 million rupees per family, there should be better terms. Around this time, there's also a Forest Rights Act, which recognizes community rights. There's a huge division in people interested in conservation between those who believe Protection should be through the state securing areas for the tiger and associated fauna, flora, and forests, or others who believe in community rights. But 15 years on, there are two things which are very significant. One, that the fear of extinction was probably overdone, both in the 1990s and in the early 2000s. And even if it was overdone, remedial action to some extent has worked. Now, whether the number of tigers is 3,000 or 3,100, or 2,800, or 2,900, there is very little doubt that India has turned the page on the question of extinction. When we look ahead, it becomes more complicated. One of the reasons, of course, is that unlike in the 1970s and 80s, today we study not only animals, but their genes. And Professor Uma Ramakrishnan of the National Center for Biological Sciences assures us through her extensive work that the genetic variability of tigers in India is incredible. We also know from her work and those of very gifted younger scholars that tigers crisscross large areas of land and uh, they are interbreeding. There are tigers in Nagarjuna Sagar, which is in Andhra, Telangana, who have uh, been, you know, whatever the correct word is, interbred with tigers from Kanha National Park and so on. So there is a lot of tiger traffic happening and we can't look at these reserves in isolation. At the same time, there are areas which are relatively cut off where inbreeding is happening. And recent records about uh, a so-called orange stripeless tiger or a black tiger in one park in Northeast India, one in East India, have been pointed out by her as possible instances of early inbreeding. This leads to the other issue, which is that <coughs> many of the tiger landscapes which were identified by 2005 and continue to be identified are today being broken up not because of the agrarian population, not because of expanding agriculture, not because of cattle grazing, not because of shifting cultivation, but because a country which has had record economic growth since 1980, 1980 on India re-emerges, as it was in 50s, 60s, by the way, as one of the fastest growing economies in the developing world. We've had five, seven, eight years of 8% growth. Now, there's debate on what the growth rate is, but it's certainly higher than most other countries in the world. And one of the forms of that growth is increased extraction of coal, oil, gas, 
and ways to transport them and the goods that are used to produce them. So linear projects, uh, NH7, which cuts off two tiger reserves in the Northeast, a rail line become very critical. So now you're not looking at reserves for the tiger, you're looking at the relation of the tiger to the larger living landscape. And if one may be so bold, what happens to a living landscape when key elements of it turn out not to be living? So that's where we are right now. The other is in where at the crossroads, of course, is that much of the notion of conservation in the 60s, 70s, not only in India, but in many other countries, was what has been called by the very fine geographer who worked on East Africa, fortress conservation. The idea that you would lock out the deleterious human influences and protect nature within this. To me, one of the finest scholars who disproved this was a person who set out as a believer. The believer who becomes a skeptic has a very special place in our narrative. M.D. Madhusudan wrote his doctorate on the wild ruminants of Bandipur, park which has had no forestry, no human settlements for a very long time. And he found that there's a range of wild ruminants ranging from the mouse deer to the elephant inside. And he calculated all the herbage taken away by the 100,000 cattle who go inside. That was his doctorate thesis. Having completed his doctoral thesis, he left to postdoctoral work, where he changed the question. He didn't ask what the impact of the cattle who go inside is, he asked why they are going there. And his paper was to be published in Ambio, journal of the Swedish, uh, you know, the Royal Academy of Sciences, very difficult journal to publish in. And he showed that the reason the cattle are grazing in there is because their main product is not milk, but cow dung. But cow dung in this area, which was earlier used as fuel, or as fertilizer had now become a market product. It was sent to the hills nearby because the farmers, the planters, they grew organic coffee. And they were competing with the Colombian organic coffee breeders. And he drew a very interesting chart relating the price of cow dung outside of Bandipur to the international price of organic coffee. So these market linkages made the border meaningless. Now it's very important. These are not people who are poaching or killing animals. Similar impact of people who go into the forest to gather wood for burning for food. About 100,000 families are dependent on Bandipur. And uh, it's not possible really there to stop them harvesting tops and tops. Because remember, those people are also voters. In fact, many of the forest guards and rangers and watchers come from those communities. So his answer, of course, and there are others who have looked at it, is how do you create alternatives uh, to cow dung being a wood source, uh, a, a, a source of cash. Now, cow dung is a source of cash for a reason everyone in this room would sympathize with. You know, if you have a credit card, I'm sure everyone in the room has a credit card. I always ask questions. I'm sorry to tell you, many undergraduates don't know the answer. We won't tell their parents, will we? Uh, it seems if you don't pay a credit card bill for one year, the interest is 43%. But Madhusudan points out, most of these people are servicing loans which begin at 80%. It's a, it's a, it's a compound interest. It goes up to 80, 140. The reason they need the cow dung it's like the reason farmers produce milk. It's to get ready cash to pay the debt. It's very important. So you cannot stop these people. You have to create some other focus. So what happens to the fortress when larger socioeconomic changes seep through the walls of the fortress? This is one case, the cow dung economy. The other, of course, is of peripatetic animals and having these larger landscapes. Important. And I'll end with a very uh, different kind of note, which is that uh, many of the areas in India which have been set aside for conservation are areas where the normal indicators of development, they would fall off the map. And many of the people living in the areas, particularly those of scheduled tribes and other forest-reliant communities, would rank lowest in terms of any indices we take. We can take any index, literacy, uh, income, years spent in school, disposable, you know, uh, uh, money and so on and so forth and precisely these groups have over the last 30 40 years become not only more politicized but much more aware of their rights so democracy is good for liberty we all know that don't we it turns out it can also be good for liberty of non-human species the tiger has survived democracy democracy has saved the tiger Please look at the fate of the tiger in the one-party states of uh, Indochina. This is not an advertisement of democracy with dictatorship. Look at the turns China took. You know, yeah. through the 1960s, it's very important. Tigers were hunted in China. There's a very good book by Chris Coggins where he shows how in southwest China, the China tiger, as it was called, was 
branded a counter revolutionary gomindang bandit and they they killed probably various estimates 2 to 3000 tigers as part of their revolutionary duty because the tiger was an enemy of production because this was mao's great ideological drive so you have seen a turn around china now wants to breed tigers uh, in order to bring down the prices now it's gone from you know ideologically orientated destruction of an animal to trying to commercialize it to save it now there have been checks and balances the russian case is very interesting because there from the 20s they started protecting the tiger and this seems to have been reasonably successful to the 90s when the soviet union broke up it's been revived now so i think the liberty part is fine but what about equality and here i think there is an ecological critical end with this i think the tiger in the 70s was a symbol of the monsoon forest lot of conservation was about tiger and associated species and the forest and both of these did what all superstars do amitabh bachchan pran you know what superstars do they cast a shadow you forget all the other actors tigers are found in only 10% of the land area of india when we think of conservation we should also think of the waters and the sea if you add all of that if you add the exclusive economic zone and the land area is 5 million square kilometers tigers there are only 100 300000 square kilometers so the shadow of the tiger is very important it is casting a shadow over other equally vital landscapes same arid areas littoral coral like and warm that's one taxa the other is this particular technique if you have thought about it banning grazing stopping felling moving out people was also oriented towards the monsoon forest it was largely oriented towards timber forests and hunting districts there may be several other ecologies where human presence may actually be beneficial for certain kinds of species rights in fact one might argue that if you're going to think of a landscape level approach now the tiger for its own reasons needs friends beyond the forest department a handful of scientists and middle class office senators i don't know how far this is true a biologist friends would argue that biology is irreducible you know that one tiger 50 deer equation maybe but uh, how do we think of the tiger not just as a symbol of a fortress conservation uh, how do we not just think of the tiger as a symbol of national unity diversity but what about other kinds of diversity should diversity include diverse forms of livelihood should it include diverse kinds of humans what about when those humans have great disparities between them i don't know what the answers are but it seems to me 21st century india 21st century asia has to think beyond the fortress and even for the tiger's own sake perhaps be on the tiger with apologies of course to pran sher khan and all those guys thank you sorry went on thank you thank you very much professor rangrajan for this wonderful presentation i will now let dr chafda discuss your work thank you um thank you dr gautier and i would like to thank the institute for giving me this uh, opportunity to be here uh, it's a very difficult task that uh, i have been set uh, i must confess because um, to uh, be a discussant after such a brilliant uh, exposition uh, ultimately is an act of vandalism so do forgive me um yes i before, i would like to uh, ask one or two questions to professor rangrajan perhaps he would like to give us a little more detail on 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 that sort of thing uh coming to 1972 uh, all the reasons and all the causes that dr rangrajan gave us are absolutely uh, excellent there is no question of uh, denying all those but there was one other reason which took place and this is i'm talking in terms of the background of what happened in 1972 the starting of the project tiger which is that if you accept the figure of say 25000 tigers in 1900 which was the figure which was worked out by ranjit singh and sakla as against ep gee's figure of 40000 1900 how many tigers were there in 1941 all right if you say there were let's take a, just pick a figure out of uh, the hat and say there were 10000 tigers in 1941 by the way please say that there were 20 or please say there are 5 Uh, it makes no difference the point is by the time you come to 1972 there were only less than 2000 tigers left so there was this period great hiatus between 1947 and 
1972. I would say great hiatus between 1952 and 1947. Why I'm, 1952 and 1972. Why I'm saying this is that up to 1952, there was the fear of the imperial government. There was the fear of the princely states. This disappeared with the first election. All right, that I can choose my government. And with that came all the uh, licenses and so on. So massive destruction took place. And therefore, were it not the same top-down conservation model which was followed earlier, had it not been followed by Indira Gandhi, he would perhaps not have had a project tiger. Perhaps, uh, Mahesh, you might like to comment on this and then I will go on to the next one. Is that all right? Is that the way you want it to go? Mahesh, would you like to take this on? No, there is no doubt a period from 40s to 60s is enormous uh, transformation. I dated a little earlier. You know, to me, uh, 1939 would be the date. I think we underestimate the environmental uh, impact of the Second World War. Uh, the Second World War is not only a war between men and women, where 50, 60 million people died. It's not only a war where there is destruction of towns and uh, villages, and it's also a new level of war against nature. And uh, my sense is that those uh, transformations continue into independent India. The reason they continue is because this idea that you should push back the forest line, drain the wetlands, expand cultivation, which may have been an imperial idea because empire is fighting, becomes a nationalist idea. It's very deep. And I think this affects a lot of the fauna. It particularly affects the ungulates. Of course, it affects the flora once you start clearing these lands. Was there an alternative to the top-down model? We don't know. What we can say is that, uh, you know, there is a crisis in the 50s, 60s of another sort of heritage, which you're all familiar with, which is a song and dance. You know, the Carnatic music and Hindustani music, just to give an instance, the great dance forms, Kuchipudi, Bharatanatyam, Odisha, were largely patronized by zamindars, princes, and what in Tamil Nadu was known, it's a very strange term called minor. Minor is the younger son of the large owner who basically does only this. But often that person knew these arts and crafts very well. And even though all of them were not disinherited immediately after independence, I really like the date you came up with, 52, because that is when the big debate starts on Zamindari abolition. Now, one of the consequences of Zamindari abolition is this whole estate which, which has provided for this over centuries, very unequal, breaks up. You see this in a very brilliant biography recently of M.S. Subalakshmi, the crisis they face. Now, what rescued them? I have a, I'm not a historian of this, but I have a one-line answer. It's not the academy, Sahit Academy, Lalit Kala Academy and uh, Sangeet Nath Academy, it's All India Radio, it's HMV. See, there is a transformation from the court to the national stage. And Lakshmi Subramanian has written about this. This doesn't happen with fauna flora. And that is very top down. And there is a very conscious effort to look at, now they define what is classical, please remember. There's a big debate, what is classical, what is not. Any form of music, this is a big debate. To me, all, all, all music is great, that's fine. Similarly here, this is very much a top down approach. And I think we should be clear, they believed it's a crisis. I want to quote, uh, since you're former president, WWF, unfortunately, I've lost this pamphlet. I had it as a schoolboy. There's a firm called Ogilvy and Matra. Yes, yes. They helped design the, the material for World Wildlife Fund, who did raise yes. $1 million. They had a very nice uh, slogan. They said, not so much the 11th hour as 10 minutes to Mulnat. It's a beautiful slogan. That is the feeling they had. That's why it's similar to the Green Revolution. In the Green Revolution, it's a top-down approach. Of course, there it is national self-reliance for producing more wheat and rice. Here, I'm not saying produce more tigers, but protect them so they'll breed. So definitely it's top-down, and there is definitely a deep sense of crisis. This is not only with the tiger. We see this in the projects on the crocodile, the rhinoceros, efforts with, uh, you know, ivory poaching. There is a sense of mission, you know, and this idea of a nation, uh, top-down, protecting something which is common. So this, of course, brings it. So I, I think you do have a very important point. This, the way they are reading the history of the previous 20, 30 years is like that. Okay, um, may I come to the next one? See, um, preservation of a large uh, fauna is always a very long-term affair, okay? 
uh, look at the preservation of the land, for instance. It started with uh, 1879, okay? And today we have something like 700 lions loitering around in 30,000 square kilometers of Saurashtra. Uh, in 1950, the Chief Minister of Assam wrote to the Prime Minister to say that we have virtually lost uh, rhinoceros in Assam. Today you have 4,000 of them. Uh, well, tiger, of course, everyone is, knows that from whatever less than 2,000 today, you say about 4,000 of them. So I think in all these cases, we have reached a watershed, all right? The methods that we employed so far for conservation have worked and they will continue to work. But in my opinion, there is a very limited uh, scope for them to work in the manner that has worked so far. And I'd like to bring in Sankla, who I happen to know personally and respect him a great deal. I used to agree with him 100% and I still do that the nature as we know it wants to be left alone. Protect it, it will regenerate. And it regenerates in every case that I know. All right, there are certain unexpected results like prosopis juliflora coming in, you can't help or you can say uh, uh, lantana bush coming in, you, uh, uh, nothing has been done, but that's a management issue. I think we reached a stage in our conservation efforts where because of increasing population, which is going to continue to increase, I mean, human population going to continue to increase till 2050, I'm told, what you're going to be left with are only very few isolated islands. And today, if you can see the policies of the government, the present government, perhaps it's inevitable, that that, that sanctity of a protected area is virtually gone because of linear uh, intrusions in them. So there is now not a position where you can claim that you can, you just leave the nature to regenerate itself. You will have to use a great amount of artificial inputs. The most important thing in my point of view is that you, you talked of certain inbred tigers, okay? Corridors are disappearing, few that are left perhaps will go, except perhaps in Bandipur, Mutumlai and uh, Bainad uh, sanctuaries or maybe if some parts of uh, Bangladesh and uh, Indian Sundarbans or whatever. So what you need to do is to have a greater amount of intervention in protecting your forests and your, uh, and your megafauna, let's say the tiger. My worry is that the way we are going, there is a lot of centralization of political authority at the top but there is a dissipation of authority at the bottom. And I don't see any local or grassroots activities to the extent that is required, taking over the place of the top-down model. Perhaps you might like to comment on that. Much question requires a different lecture. Uh, just to go to the last, uh, yes, there is uh, need the, the grassroots activity, to paraphrase, Raza Kasmi is a very interesting work on East Central India, where in many of the Adivasi areas over the last 30 years, there has been large movement of Jal Jangal Zameen, that is authority of the Adivasis, uh, mm. scheduled tribes and others over the water, land and forest. And he uh, questions, what about Janwar? Why is animal not coming out? And his argument is in many parts of Jharkhand the types of hunting that have been practiced earlier are today destructive. The context has changed. So the pada where you go and beat all the animals and kill them was fine 50 years ago. It isn't today. And the new generation does not have the awareness of the forest, which the older does. At the same time, he also shows that in areas like a Nagarjuna Sagar Sri Silo, which were controlled by Maoists in very brutal ways for many years, no one from forest department went in there for many years. Now the Maoist threat has declined. When they went in and did all these camera counts of tigers, they found the numbers are the same. And the reason is interesting, in this particular area, the Chenchus do not hunt. They very rarely hunt. And they don't let anyone hunt. They, they live quite peacefully with tigers. So we do need to identify which are the areas where which kinds of activities, which humans works in a cohabited landscape. Here, I would say the shadow of the tiger is deep. You know, a lot of the excellent work which has been done on two species, very good work. 
on the snow leopard, there's a range of scholars. The five snow leopard states have a project snow leopard, very different orientation from tiger because snow leopard ranges, of course, include where people live. A lot of snow leopard diet. They never kill humans, but they do love goats and sheep. And uh, there are ways to have insurance schemes, to have no-go zones where you compensate. This has been done particularly in parts of Skiti. But there are similar attempts, not only in various parts of snow leopard territory in India, but in other snow leopard rain states in Central Asia. The other I would cite, of course, is the leopard. So all the recent work on leopard, including government census shows, because the leopards are not in the protected areas. They never were. And uh, most biologists will tell you off record, hypothesizing from some excellent studies, that the number of street dogs, because stray dog is a wrong term, street dogs, domestic pigs, monkeys, dogs, and feral cattle is enough to support leopards in several landscapes. The real issue of the leopard is when it starts attacking and taking children, which they do in some places. And of course, uh, where there are these linear projects coming in, that can really harm the leopard and construction. So again, we are back to the landscape issue. So I would like to put it differently. Centralization may start out by saying it is there to protect the fauna and flora. But centralization also has other economic objectives. Think of country like United States, which led the world with Endangered Species Act, by the way, in 1972. Richard Nixon, Republican, declared timber wolf a protected species. It's something remarkable. Can you think of a single Republican who would say that today? If they are, they are themselves very rare species. Mm. But, uh, you know, many people are very critical of Mr. Trump because he wanted to open the Alaska Wildlife Refuge. Please note, in the wake of Ukraine war, the, Biden has come up with very similar ideas on fracking and self-reliance. So I think that economic drive and impulse is common to political systems. And the, the, the reality of grassroots activity is that much more empowerment of the Gram Panchayat or the Gram Sabha would, is often resisted, not only by the federal government, but by state governments, because the same processes are happening at the state government. So that there is a larger change. And if I can put it in a line, after the 80s, government in India and in many other countries of the world, from the end of the 70s on earlier in other places, instead of government being the prime, prime driver of growth, particularly of capital investment, it became the facilitator of private investment. It's very important. Once the government becomes a facilitator of private investment, its main way of judging its success failure is how far it can facilitate that. It doesn't matter who's in power. It's going to be that way. So that logic has to be questioned. And here I will argue, I don't think Project Tiger questioned that logic. Because while it was cast as protection of the tiger and from the 70s on its wilderness, it's being done in a very technocratic fashion. Precisely these instruments, which were there to secure that habitat, can also be the instruments to take apart the habitat. And that's exactly what you're saying. They're putting a linear project through that area. Best example is Panna. They restocked the tigers. The tigers are back. But once Ken Betwa comes, most of 100 square kilometers will disappear under the water. So even if the grassroots activity or the median range activity is weak, it has to be given a try because at this level, it's unlikely to work anyway. So even if it doesn't work, Maybe it has to work better. Sorry, that's a ideological answer, but I can go into that more. Um, all right, this is my last uh, intervention, and thank God because I have very little to ask. Um, yes, um, so far, a megafauna, whether it's the rhinoceros, the tiger, the lion, or whatever has been, to a great extent, responsible for protecting the entire ecosystem of the area. What is forgotten, for instance, I'll take the instance of the lion for a moment, I'll move away from the tiger, because of the lion protection becoming a political issue with the government of Gujarat, it receives the kind of protection which perhaps no other animal receives in the country, not even the tiger. That said, it's because of the lion that something like 1,200 or 1,400 square kilometers of the Gir forest survives. Now I'm coming to something slightly different. Gir forest is the source of six major river systems of Saurashtra, which waters the whole peninsula, which also is responsible for the water level to be in the surrounding areas to be pretty good compared to other areas. 
we have done most of our conservation work hiding behind the mega, megafauna. I think the time has come now where we need to express ourselves, the conservationists, the government, NGOs, people like you and me, that we need to protect these things, not because of the animal, but because we need to protect ourselves. If, for instance, the Gir forest would go, the six rivers would go with it. They would dry up. What happens then? Suppose the tiger were to go, say, take a forest like Savai Madhapur would go, or at least disappear most of it, and with it, the water levels in the water tables in the surrounding areas would go down. What happens then? I think a time has come where conservation effort has to move away, not necessarily at the cost of the animal, but more and more effort needs to be made to say that we need conservation of these forests and landscapes for our own survival. Perhaps you might like to make a comment on that. Now I'll be through this since you quoted lion and Gujarat. See, Tamil Nadu, the state tree is Palmyra palm. Now, Palmyra palm is very important because 40 45 percent Tamil Nadu is semi arid. Palmyra palm has been cultured and grown by farmers for centuries. Because if you grow Palmyra palm, it also acts as a fence. It also gives a number of uh, products. And you could find different trees in different parts of India. For me, Central West, North India, it would be Mahua, Madhuka, Indica, whose regeneration is in deep trouble, by the way, yeah. for a variety of reasons. In Western India, it would be Khejri. It's interesting, one of the major initiatives in West Bengal of West Bengal government is to regrow the mangrove, the Sundari tree. Yeah. So why, why, why not, if you make trees the center, and I'm talking of trees which are very important in both inhabited landscapes, in utilized landscapes, and in non-utilized landscapes. See, here you are getting a connection across the land. We need to think of this. See, there's something very interesting about these big animals. I, somebody asked me yesterday, why are we so fascinated by lion, tiger, and whatever. And I said, one reason is they can kill and eat you. The mm. other is they can stomp on you. Imagine a rhino or, or an elephant. It's size. And there's no reason not to be fascinated by it. But we should only be fascinated by size. This, this fascination is coming also because is it, you know, you wonder, is the tiger there because it helped create a fortress? Today, we're in a situation where there are many tiger reserves, which virtually have no tigers. Mukundra, there's one tiger transient. Why is it a tiger reserve? It's a very interesting question. And one reason is that it's got a momentum of its own. Whereas with Palmyra, to protect it, plant it and grow it is a formidable uh, uh, responsibility. It's, again, as you said, you know, it's looking many years into the future. And uh, uh, I would, again, since I'm looking at, you know, rulers, you know, in many parts of southern India, rulers, particularly the Nayakas, they planted trees which have a lifespan of hundreds of years. I always wonder why did this person go and plant 20 banyan trees? There's no way they were going to see it. No way they were going to see it. Because there is a notion of uh, doing good beyond your lifetime. I think that, you know, we can think of other kinds of symbols and the time has come for that. Yeah. And Rajasthan, again, to, because you live there, I have to say something nice. Rajasthan had a flower for every district, a bush and tree. for. Now, they've not done very much about it. So we can think of nature in a much more inclusive and different way because these are creatures around us. You know, how many kids have seen a tiger? That's why the animal we suggested for a national heritage animal is elephant. Elephant is an animal all children know to draw. Most children in India have seen an elephant or hope to see one. And they don't have to go to a forest. Now, they don't know the difference between a forest elephant. But an elephant is a much better ambassador to the animal world than a tiger. Because it's going to, you know, it's, 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 you can't go and pat a tiger, can you? <laughs> you can't give it a bana and it sort of conk you on the head. Which, believe me, if it's happened to you as a child, you'll never forget it. You feel very special not knowing there are 10 or 100 kids behind you. So we can think of other symbols, you know, and trees, plants, creepers, bushes. I mean, they are there in the songs and in, you know, the celebrated daily life. Thank you very much, Dr. Chavda, for your questions and, and Professor uh, Rangrajan for your answers. So now we will open the floor to questions from uh, the audience, both online and in this room. Uh, if you have, if you're online and you have a question, uh, what I would suggest is that you use the chat box or raise your hand. I uh, wanted to clarify this. I realized that I've switched myself off. Um, so I just wanted to come back to one of your 
conclusion points, which is this connection between tiger preservation and democracy, uh, because this is something that again came up in the questions raised by Dr. Charda, you suggested that there was a connection between tiger preservation and democracy. At the same time, it seems that very often these have been at the, you know, at loggerheads with each other. So Dr. Charda suggested that, for example, post-1952 uh, with the first general elections, but also with the fall of princely states and, and, the, and, the, and the, reform, the, the reform of the large zamindari estates, uh, you know, there was a uh, a rise in the attacks against tigers. So maybe these uh, democratization processes actually endangered uh, tigers. Um, conversely, the tiger project, as you many times repeated, is was it very much a top-down project, which also led to the displacement of local populations. So this could be seen as quite anti-democratic in many ways. Um, in many ways, this debate makes me think of uh, the debates around the preservation of heritage monuments, uh, where again, you know, there's a risk of fossilization of monuments, which are otherwise used in many diverse ways. Um, and what we have seen in recent decades is, you know, efforts to, to transform precisely the preservation of heritage monuments so that we can reconcile the wide range of practices around these monuments and, and the preservation of these monuments. I am thinking, for example, of, you know, we are in Delhi of the Aga Khan Foundation efforts to renovate the entire area around Humayun's tomb uh, and to make it as inclusive as possible by taking into consideration the training of the local population in Nizamuddin. So to what extent, and this is really coming from, you know, uh, uh, someone who's ignorant, um, to what extent can we really reconcile democracy and and, and wildlife preservation, and to what extent has wildlife conservation integrated these efforts to reconcile the needs of, for example, uh, local communities, local usages, and preservation of tigers? You have partly addressed this question already in your, in your answers, but I just wanted to know if you could elaborate a bit more on this connection between democracy and tiger preservation. What I suggest is before uh, you answer that we take uh, a round of questions, because I'm sure that many uh, in the audience would want to ask questions. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. And I can see that there are some uh, questions in the chat box. I will take a bit of time to read them. So I will first let people in the audience here in the room ask their questions, and then I will certainly go to the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. We will take maybe one or two more questions in the room and then we will let Professor uh, Rangrajan answer and then we'll take more questions. So Joel and then, uh, yeah, so first Joel and then, but you can come a bit closer already. Um, wait, it's actually a question for you too and I'll be very brief because I mean there are many questions around, but how would you locate the importance, the role, the function, uh, I mean, and the future maybe of institutions such as the Wildlife Institute of India or as other institutional hub, you know, important places that you find in Dehradun way in other places, as a matter of fact, in the United States. So, you know, the National Forest Indira Gandhi, the National Forest Academy, the Forest Research Institute. I mean, are these still playing any roles? And what's the relation between the government of India and these institutions today in Project Tiger or in other, you know, Chita related, Wikipedia related, whatever it is, projects? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Surinder Singh. Um, perhaps you will remember from my student. So, thank you. The question, uh, so uh, 
recently United Nations uh, there was summit at 2019 and mm. now to fight this climate change mm. uh, nature-based solutions are being touted as mm. the new kind of like a silver bullet that it, it, it does the forestation as well, removes the carbon, but at the same time, farmers can make some money as well when they plant trees and everything. Mm-hmm. So I would request you to comment on how do you see if this can actually help the rest of the, let's say, connected projects as well, tiger fronts and everything, mm-hmm. and at the same time, help the climate change. Thank you. Thank you. So we will now let you, uh, let Professor Angrajan answer these questions and then we'll go for the second round. Thank you. Okay. So uh, many of these questions are food for thought and I'll have to think very hard. So I may not come up with an answer now. There may not be an answer. No, on the last year, there is a big debate on ecosystem services. There's uh, Dr. Madhu Verma, Wild, uh, World Resources Institute in Delhi, who has done a lot of costing of tiger reserves and tried to assess what is their larger economic and social impact. And her argument is that there is an enormous positive economic impact even of the existing reserves. Uh, there's similar work of a different nature a report in 2017 uh, by Raghuram Chundavar, Jona Van Grusen, which might interest you the four reserves, tiger reserves in Madhya Pradesh at that time. They generate uh, four times the outlay on them. So the amount of outlay is some 40 crore and they generate 160 crore. And they argue that wildlife tourism actually can have a spread effect, not only in terms of jobs, but in terms of spreading the wealth around. Academies. These academies you are naming are government academies. Most of them are headed by members of the Forest Service. The Forest Service has had a very important role in Indian history. But as you are well aware, when the Imperial Forest Service was constituted, there were no foresters in India. They brought uh, three botanists in a row who were German. But they didn't have them in the States. Therefore, they brought officers from the British Indian Army. So please recall General, you know, Colonel Forsyth, I can give you a long list, Colonel Gibson, Colonel Watson. So within Forest Department, the top down is much stronger than in the civil service. I'm not an advocate of Imperial Civil Service against Imperial Forest Service, but the manner of training in Imperial Service is very different. It was Haleybury College, and then it was taken over and they set up their own academy. And in the civil service, not only are they engaging with the civilian population and therefore their revenue officials, Therefore, they are among the first critics of the forest department. They keep saying the forest department, by putting all these restrictions, is making people discontented. And therefore, we are having a law and order problem. But in the forest department, because of this tradition, the internal debate historically is very limited. And if you recall, I don't know how, if you if you talk to a divisional forest officer, he'll always say, my forest. It's very interesting. I always, always Whose forest is it? Is it yours? You know, whose forest is it? Because actually, the forest department, this is a very important issue because up to a certain point, a huge number of the foresters, forget whether they were imperialists or marauders or whatever. Remember, they were walking on foot. Prior to 1920, the travels in the dry season were done on foot and horseback and elephant back. The coming of the motor car changes that. What has now happened, it's become a highly bureaucratized service. So I have my doubts. You see, each of these is a very important institute. It's had a very important contribution. I don't want to run it down. But within these institutions, how much quality science are they doing? How much quality scholarship are they doing is a question. And because they are run by government, they are under government ministries. And in, in all societies and countries, that creates its own tensions, which don't need to be elaborated. There is this contradiction, sir, between the animal as icon and we see the animal as umbrella. But you, you know, umbrella protects you from the rain and the sun. But if the umbrella casts a deep shadow, it also prevents other life forms from growing. You know, it was always said about leadership in this country. We had two types of leaders. One who enabled lots to grow, grass grows around their feet. Another who cast such a deep shade, they allowed no other leader to come up. You can look at our history and decide who was which. It's very important. So I think this is there's a contradiction within it. This idea of the tiger as the symbol is also limiting. And this is related to, to Dr. Gautier's question. Democracy historically has authoritarian features, even at the time it is democratized. When you look at the 20th century, one of the very interesting figures who survives as a very inspiring figure for people across the range, except in the small part of narrow part of American right, is Franklin Roosevelt. It's a remarkable book about him called The Green New Deal. This is the original Green New Deal, not the one wanted by some Democrats now. That, the, the, the New Deal had a very important green component. 
They created the civilian conservation force who planted millions of trees. They built shelter bonds. They did soil conservation. At a time, America was a largely rural society. Along with rural electrification and public works, it really gave work to a lot of poor people. One out of three African-American men was employed in one of these works. It's an astonishing, it's the largest ever federal aid before the 1960s for African-Americans. But they were segregated. So if you see the very jolly President Roosevelt with the CCC, there are either white boys, white girls as they were then known, or blacks. He, he mingled with them. It's not that he never went there. But they were a segregated force. So the same thing we can see here. This, the same kind of initiative in one dimension can open up. In another, the same process which opens can close. Now, the interesting thing about this country, to quote the great John Robinson, anything you say about India, the opposite is true. So give you an instance. Tamil Nadu, uh, Satyamangalam Forest Reserve, uh, Tiger Reserve, which one of the very famous cheetah records comes from there. It was shot by a British officer. Satyamangalam has a very substantial number of revenue villages inside. No Tamil Nadu government will move them out. Now, there are many reasons why. It has a very powerful opposition and powerful ruling party. It has both at all times. Since 1967 and even before, it's had, since 62, it's had both. But the density of tigers is roughly the same as it is in much better protected reserves where there are no people inside. One reason could be that in Tamil Nadu, the labor force has largely moved from agriculture long ago. Barely 12% of GDP is from agriculture. People are not going into the forest to take out wood. So the same picture, when you look at much of North, Northwest, Central, East India is completely different. So I think, you know, how democracy pans out and works in a diverse federal system is different, but democracies have authoritarian features. And we shouldn't forget national parks of US when they were first set up. US got national park in 1872. It got a service in 1916. From 1870 to 1916, it was protected by the army. I am serious. And when you put the army there, please have no illusions. One of the good things about the army is they have a very simple rule. They have the power to shoot and they have to. That's their order. They are also protected by law for that. So I think that element is there here. So the other dimension of this today would be Kaziranga. Phenomenal success, 4,000 rhinos, but shoot at sight orders. It's a very nice new book by Zonzoi Borbora, where he says the protection of the rhino is a deep matter of deep pride in Assam. It's a highly militarized protection model. Now, they would argue we have to militarize it because if we don't militarize the protection, the rhinos will be killed and their horns will be chopped off. So democracies face this dilemma and India faces it on a large scale. It's common with other democracies. Very brief intervention. You asked what's going to happen to these institutions. Uh, and Mahesh very rightly point, pointed out that these institutions are headed by uh, people from the forest department. Now here there is a very interesting uh, mismatch. People from the forest department are managers. They're not scientists, right? These institutions, I would have imagined, at least most of them, like Wildlife Institute of India and so on, should have been uh, sort of headed by scientists who would be able to give the advice which the managers should then carry out. Now, if these institutions are completely subordinated to the forest department, which may be the case now where we are moving in that direction, I personally think that the value of this institution will certainly go down as time come, uh, goes through. So I'm aware that it's almost 6.30 yet and we have not let uh, any person online ask questions. So what I will do now is uh, read uh, at least some of the questions which are online. Um, so the first question is, are industrial emissions, polluted waters, high levels of chemicals in ground soil in North India affecting wildlife like tigers? I shortening their lives. So that's the first question. Then um, could Professor Rangrajan want to speculate on some new energies unleashed by Hindutva ideology and uh, melding of con conservation and religious beliefs. I would guess this is not happening right now in India, but do you think this might happen? And if yes, what directions uh, might this take? And um, then one more uh, question maybe. Thanks for great talk as usual. Do you think in, in the Indian context, the focus of the research on tigers has been on counting them and we have been leaders in this particular aspect. However, we have missed the information on ecology of tigers that need to be assessed time to time in the dynamic systems. Do you think our failure to understand ecology hampers our ability to mitigate conflict 
which is the need of the hour. And maybe if you don't mind, I just, since we had four questions, let me put the fourth question. So we have quite a few. <laughs> uh, so um, I have a question specifically on the role of formal law to contribute positively to the narrative that is created around state's power, the necessity to have a market for conservation and preservation and protection of certain non-human species. Thank you. So maybe you will. <laughs> If you want to go back to these questions they are written, I'll just put them back on the screen. So the role of formal law to contribute positively is very significant. But as you are well aware, how effectively a law is depends on the capability of the executive to enforce and the extent to which people cooperate. In 1929, there was Sarda Act passed for the, on the marriage age of women. And as of 2011, there was a very important state in North India where 50% of the women, their age of marriage was under the age prescribed, not under Sarda Act, but as amended in 1976. So that applies to all laws, certainly to laws about forests, water, pollution, and so on and so forth. And it must be pointed out that from the 90s, there has been a phase of judicial activism of courts telling the executive what to do. The Godavarman case where Several cases on forests, over 13,000 were transferred to an empowered committee is one case. This, of course, leads to a different constitutional question. Is it the job of court to take over the role of the executive? And even if it were, would it be able to carry it through? And even if it carries it through, are these questions which go beyond the law to touch other issues? And it's important the Forest Rights Act was partly a response to the Godavarman case because one of the results of the empowered committee wanted all people who are encroaches in all forests moved out. And one of the features I've hardly touched on, which is important, is that while in the 50s and 60s there were major land reforms in India on cultiv cultivated arable land, zamindari abolition, and so on and so forth, there were many limitations and holes in the law, but it did get done. That kind of feudal landlord which existed in the 50s is extinct today, even in areas such as Bihar. But to the forests, the first annual recognition is as late as 2006. Until then, the people living in the forests were tenants at will. They had privileges, concessions, no rights. It's very important, especially in reserved forests. There were some rights in protected forests. Research on the tiger. It's a fantastic question. There is a very serious issue because conservation bodies, and I say this with the greatest respect, grantees are driving research. Conservation over the last 50 years has tended to become some of it like bean counting. How many tigers, how many rhinos? So when snow leopard was, they said there are a lot of snow leopards, so it should not be declared endangered, it will be threatened, it will be vulnerable. There was protest from the organizations which work for snow leopards, which leads you to wonder, why are they doing this? And one answer is we must, it, it is very important that knowledge for its own sake be pursued. And I'm really struck by your point that the kind of work which was done on tiger behavior, the Smithsonian Ecology Project, doesn't have much counterpart in India. And if you look, for instance, just forget carnivores for half a second. Please look at primatologists in India over the last 70 years. The kind of work they have done on primate behavior is absolutely fascinating. From bonnet macaques to rhesus macaques to lion tail macaques to crab eating macaques. So definitely larger studies, not in an ecology and behavior, but on the larger interlinkages of different life forms are absolutely vital. In fact, in the interest of the tiger itself, species other than the tiger should be studied. It's a very famous article by Madhusudan Katti, why warblers are more important than tigers. He wrote it in response to the field director who told him he's wasting his time working on birds which nobody wants to look at. So you can read the article. Has Hindutva ideology and religious belief unleashed new energies? Absolutely. But please remember again, see, on the one hand, in Hinduism, there is a belief of sacralizing religion. Hmm. You can see the enormous reverence which is accorded to an animal like the elephant. And I will recount to you a very well-known story which was recounted to us in Elephant Task Force about uh, elephants which were killed by a train in uh, part of Assam. And all the third surrounding villages organized the funerary rites for the elephant. It was treated like a family member. Somebody put in the money for the, you know, the ceremonial feast. Somebody put in the money for the wood. Somebody got hold of a priest. And it was mourned as a member of the community. But, 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 in the same trip, in the same day, they come to another valley where an elephant has been killed. And they have written Dana Chor Murtabar, that is death to the robber of the grain. 
So it's a very complicated relationship of religiosity with nature, which we should be careful. Of. We don't we, we don't know which way it will go. I think again, when you talk Hindutva ideology, it's a large question. But again, one can give the case of Gujarat, which uh, Dr. Dibibanu Singh said these 700 lions over half are beyond the Gir forest, and the various systems Gujarat government successively have had since the 70s, more so since 90s is to involve panchayats and communities in monitoring of lions. And I think it's a remarkable uh, case which should be studied. At the same time, in the same areas, the linear projects are coming. There are more people who want to build hotels so you can go and watch the lions. And they build big walls because they don't want a lion in their backyard. You know, you may not want one also, though you may want to go on a tractor and look at one feeding on a hill. So I think that the contradictions when Hindutva becomes the ideology of a ruling party, that ruling party faces the same contradictions another party took. These are very difficult issues. You know, how do you have democracy in a country where there is so much disparity in entitlements to nature? That's another dimension of it. I'm sure all of these are very important. Um, the industrial emissions, chemical pollutants affecting tigers, climate change. I don't know. I honestly don't know. We need to think more about this. Yeah. So are you okay to take one more round sure. of questions? So yeah. what I suggest is since we we have a lot of questions in the chat box. I'm not sure we'll be able to take all of them. I'll take one or two questions from the floor here, and then I'll read two, uh, two questions from the chat box. So first I'll take questions from the room. Okay, so I think you can go first and then, uh, okay, I, I saw you first, I'm sorry. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Okay, so, I mean, just to, Maybe probe a bit further. Just to probe a bit further in terms of uh, the the human side of the conflict, mm. uh, what is the farmer perspective when we look at conservation? Is it part of policy? Has it been included in the conversations? Is there a relevance? A and then B. Uh, I vaguely remember that in the case of Madhav National Park, mm. there was a tiger that was brought in for the vice uh, or for Lord Harding uh, who had visited. And so that was something that was external. I mean, it was imposed and then he never came or something. And then, then there is displacement around that. So um, I feel that there is this dynamic that's created that is like um, inherently patronizing, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that uh, we will sh do people who live around the forest protect it or not you mm. know that question is coming mm. from a certain level of mm. um, I mean from this imperial mm. patronizing sort of attitude mm. so is there a policy that has addressed it in a mm. less aggressive way maybe mm. you know like forest guards one speaks to them and sometimes there is this thing that wo log to jalate hain mm. forest ko. Yeah, mm. you know there is that general understanding so mm. is there a policy or a f something that has been a little less mm. aggressive Your name, huh? Your name? Uh, Hi. Uh, thanks for the nice uh, discussion. My name is Manish Agarwal. And recently, there has been a debate over the uh, this uh, translocation of wild cheetahs from South Africa to India, Kuno National Park MP. Mm -hmm. And uh, many points have been uh, cited in favor and uh, also against it. And scientifically, the community conservationists as well as the experts are divided. So basically, one point is that free ranging wild cheetahs, they exist in very low population densities, approximately one per 100 square meter in the best of habitats mm -hmm. and have disproportionately large hum home ranges, more than 750 square kilometers. To thrive, cheetahs need extensive suitable habitat, uh, adequate prey and very limited anthropogenic uh, uh, disturbance. Currently, India does not have sites that meet this requirement. The decision to bring cheetahs from Africa without ensuring the availability of the required habitats is akin to putting the cart before the horse. And secondly, uh, African cheetahs are not even mentioned in our National Wildlife Action Plan 2017 to 2031, but they are being prioritized over many endangered, endangered species such as the Great Indian Bustard and Asiatic Lion. So what are your thoughts uh, on it? Because uh, it has been seen as a, a populist move by the Modi government to uh, garner pu pu public attention and just a stunt, publicity stunt. And it has no scientific basis uh, behind it. So it may fail or backfire or it may affect uh, adversely uh, in the long run. Thank you. 
Yes, we will, but before we, we, we let you, sorry, I'll just, as promised, I'll read a few questions from the chat box. Um, so first of all, my question is to both uh, Dr. Vivya Bhanu Singh and Dr. Rangrajan. As you pointed out, Dr. Rangrajan, the tiger cast a shadow over many other species and ecosystems such as the littoral systems. Do you both think the arrival of the cheetah, okay, may do that now, it's also again related. Um, the hope is that cheetah will bring attention to grasslands, a very neglected landscape. But do you, th uh, do you think that uh, this will really happen? Uh, the, okay, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, Hisaraghata, grassland in Karnataka, for instance, are in danger of being lost to development as we speak. And then, since these are two very short questions, I'll read both of them. Um, do you think that small community living helps our flora and fauna mm, than living the, the way we are now? Okay, I'm not sure about this one. Um, sir, can you please tell, tell us more about the translocation of Jai decline? Actually, that's again related. So, I think... No, it's not, but since the question was asked about what will happen to the Asiatic line, it's somehow related. Two things. First, uh, shall I try and answer the cheetah one? Um, the first, uh, if I were to answer the first part of your question, I think you need another session. Uh, so I will not attempt that, but I will only say that the action plan for reintroduction of cheetah has been worked out over a period of last 10 years with very detailed work done on prey base, uh, location, size, area, and so on. You did mention about very large areas required in, in Africa for the cheetahs, it's absolutely correct. But the area of a cheetah or any predator that it requires in its range depends on the prey base and the, the amount of prey base available at that place. So the, it, it moves from place to place. I, I would not, I, I will not attempt to go into the details of it because it's a very complicated affair. Coming back to the National Wildlife Action Plan, I was a member of that, uh, one of the so-called experts, uh, one of those experts, all right? So I was a member of that committee and I had included a whole chapter on translocation of not only cheetahs, but of other animals or birds within India itself and outside where they had become extinct. But because the cheetah matter was subjudice at that time, that whole chapter was removed. Okay. But at the two, so at the fifth and sixth wild, uh, National Board for Wildlife meetings, which took place, uh, under the chairmanship of President uh, uh, of Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, the cheetah matter was discussed, and as a result of that discussion, all the detailed works took place on the cheetah. So we can go on to this, uh, but it requires a separate meeting. Coming back to the lions, as early as 1995, there was an agitation in Gujarat that we do not want to give our lions to anywhere outside Gujarat. And the chief minister in 1997, Mr. Shankar Singh Waghela, who was at that time a Congress chief minister and now BJP man, said, leave alone a lion, I will not give you a lion cub. It warms the cockles of my heart to tell you that the first person to refuse lions for Madhya Pradesh was Nawab Rasul Khan of Junagadh. He refused to give lions to Madho Maharaj in Gwalior in 1900. So the lions not going to Kuno Palpur has nothing to do with the arrivals of cheetahs. Can the lions go? I don't know if you know, I'm one of those people who have always propagated that lions do not belong to a particular people or Gujarat. I'm a Gujarati. They belong to themselves and the lions must go to Kuno Palpur. That they haven't gone so far is not because of cheetahs. Should they go now? No. Let the cheetah settle down. Now that you have come, that the cheetahs have come, let them settle down. Bring the lions. Cheetahs, no lions. Cheetahs, no leopards. And the experts from South Africa tell me that the tiger is such a cumbersome animal that cheetah will be able to work its way around. No, we need a separate debate. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we should leave it at that. Thank you very much. 
see one is the uh, movement of large animals into areas where they have become extinct is not new uh, when the american bison became extinct it was bred in bronx zoo and they were restocked in the various parks since there weren't enough bisons they brought them from canada and when they crossed the border in the rain wagon when the border crossed into united states they stopped being canadian and became american bison so it's very important the cultural attributes of the animal the animal is becoming part of a political symbol much earlier this is america 1900s when a lot of uh, very only women didn't have the right to vote forget about people of color so it's a very interesting you know american masculinity and the bison lions mother maharaj was refused lions by nawab of junagadh he was a very dynamic man in 1910 and 1920 he brought lions from sudan and released them in a place called puno they bred they brought up cubs and they were he wanted it for hunting right so the same area which is today site of cheetah release which was picked for lions to be brought was site by mother maharaj and the story the really interesting part of the story is that these lions turned on cattle some of them became human eaters they had to be shot and peripatetic animals that they were they were shot in places like jhansi and kota and bara similarly in 1957 independent india despite all the things we said about 50s 60s because indian board for wildlife in the first meeting used this word we do not want all the eggs in one basket meaning all lions should be in one should not be in one place they moved a lion and two lionesses to a sanctuary near varanasi very important town in indian history and in varanasi they created a sanctuary called chandra prabha radiance of the moon now the problem the lions again bred and in about 10 years they were gone some were poisoned some were shot they moved out so this being wild bringing back a carnivore this is one of the few countries which has done it with an animal like the lion twice biological success social failure we can get into why the other point i would like to raise a question cheetah in south africa lives in places with no anthropogenic disturbance south african conservation is a child of apartheid era and some of the most stringent inhuman racist regulations enforced by a white settler minority going back to the british period it didn't begin with apartheid in 48 so your natal park sport kruger park sabi game reserve they threw everybody out therefore those areas don't have anthropogenic disturbance however cheetahs outside of southern africa for instance east africa they live in areas where there are people because nobody has moved them out not that they aren't trying there are very nasty things happening there as we speak so we should be little careful with this we don't know and one of the pluses of the cheetah is it doesn't attack humans goats and sheep is a different matter so i think the larger challenge is the social one and i would argue that the kind of support since your question was on cultivators better word for me than farmers the kind of support for small holders livestock owners is abysmal you know 500000 people were affected in 2010 by elephants damaging crops 400 people lost their lives in 2010 to elephants now elephants don't attack you because they want to eat you up they attack you because you come in their way because they are feeding on the crops the crops are a magnet for elephants over time there are scholars who are studying this elephants have changed their behavior in certain areas because they know the time when the ragi is right to eat on a lighter note for a group of elephants or an elephant the ragi which is ripening is like a fast food restaurant they don't roam around the forest but from the farmer's view point it is really frightening today 600 people are losing their lives over 100 elephants are being killed so the the model here with small holders and large holders because a cultivator is a cultivator it doesn't matter how many occurs or with livestock owners has to be a very different one and i think that there are some ngos and some state governments which have tried i mean i can cite cobbard foundation but i would cite madhya pradesh government the last 10 years you know madhya pradesh has a service guarantee you know service guarantee when you apply for certificate and all the service guarantee on tiger cattle kill in the last 10 12 years official statistics tiger poisoning has gone down to near zero because within 48 hours they have to process your claim and they have to make the payment within x weeks so governments can respond and react and i think that a lot of this is not about the animal and people it's about state society different sections of society the other is that in many parts of this subcontinent i can't talk about the rest of the world if there is some measure of protection it may be through incentives it may be through local action soil water biomass will recover the fauna flora will come back 
you know, day before we met Vijay Dasmana, very interesting figure. He's important in this Aravli Biodiversity Park, Gurgaon. Last month, they found three plant species, which have never been found there. They've come on their own. Actually, they haven't. Some bird or animal brought them. That's how they came. Or the wind brought them. But that's because of protection. So I think the ability of the natural system to rebound I mean, much of the country is tropical and even in the temperate and trans Himalayan areas, but it, it needs a set of interventions. Smaller community self-reliance, absolutely. There is a huge, uh, you know, my old compatriot from student days, Ashish Kotari, is part of a group called Vikalp Sangam. And you can see has written an article in Scientific American. Lot of such communities and the protections of flora, fauna. Does the tiger cast shadow, will it really happen? We don't know. To quote Shakespeare, the future will unfold itself. But honestly, tell me, do you not get the sense that a lot of conservation in India is about enclosure? Yeah. After all, you know, uh, I'll end with an anecdote. My, my supervisor in Oxford was a brilliant man. He came in a Frederick Forsyth novel. His name is Maurice Keane. But he was very disappointed with my lack of knowledge of English history. Because I asked him if the Normans, if they caught hold of you poaching, would they cut off your head? He said, absolutely not. And he said, the reason is they needed a jury of 12 freemen. The population of freemen was very small, so they couldn't find 12 freemen. So I said, what would they do? He said, they were very kind. They'd cut off your finger or an arm <laughs> for poaching a deer. For poaching a deer. Please note. Because the deer is the property of the king or of the noble. I mean, it, this is about property. This is two notions of property. The ferai naturai, that the deer is every man's right or every woman's right. And the idea that the forest is a place where the king and only the king can hunt deer. Now, much of conservation in India has been about enclosure. Imperial, princely, zamindari, malgusari, whatever. Now, can we have conservation without enclosure? That's the question. And this is not a question for those villagers. It's, it's a larger question for society. And then there's the other question, which I'll, I'll, I mean, at some level, I mean, sociologically, you know, this uh, lot of this Marxist material of 19th century was about exploitation of surplus labor. And, and you know, the laborer worked very hard. And this person took it away. And governments over the years in many democracies have come in and moderated that, you know, there are laws on a fair wage, compensation, insurance, started first, of course, pension by Bismarck. But the other way to look at capital, which a lot of scholarship of the last 30 years, is that there is an accumulation of nature. And one of the things fossil fuels did is to open up the ability to accumulate through nature much faster. So when you look at, them, you know, hillsides where all the trees have been cut, 86% of the inland waters of the Indian coast are already overfished. I mean, every year more fish are being caught than are being 86%. What happens when it gets to 100%? It's only 14% 14, 14 away, isn't it? Or if you look at drawing out more water from a river, then there is water in the river. It's very interesting, isn't it? Is it still a river? So we are at that particular point. And how do you impose limits on capital? Now, this is a question not only for democracies, and for authoritarian systems, it's a global question. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. And much of what we call conservation is about this. I am very hesitant on population. See, one difference between India of 2022 and 1972, besides the fact we didn't have a census last year, first time since Second World War, is that the total fertility rate now has come down. It's at two. That Malthusian nightmare hasn't happened. Yes, it's still growing in five states, but even there it will come down. The issue isn't just the number of people, it's the environmental footprint. Some footprints have gone down. So one could argue, for instance, that more tractors means less bullocks and buffaloes. Now you imagine for this much grain, if you had bullocks and buffaloes, how much land you'd need, how much fodder, how many trees and plants they'd chomp up. Now you could argue that using the tractor is very bad because it's the drawing down fossil fuel and giving emissions. But there may be a lot of trade-offs like this. So the case I gave in Bandipur, uh, Namasanga, 80% uh, of the families, they are not going in for picking up firewood. They use gas. There's a subsidy on the gas given by a collective, not government. And the reason they don't go in is because the women don't want to go into the forest. It's a very dangerous forest. There are bears and elephants which will attack you. They'll maul you. They'll kill you. So there is, there is a lot of spaces, but those spaces depend on both. Can you put limits on rampant capital? Which I think is what the New Deal was doing in a sense. But the other is, can you enable people who have low entitlement or low levels of capital. And I think that those people are potential allies. We shouldn't look at every one of the stockholders, oh, this person has 10, uh, 20 goats, they've poisoned the wolf. Why are they poisoning the wolf? So if we were to do that, we would actually have vast, co we would make these vast cohabited landscapes not only more productive, more habitable, 
more livable, we'd make them biologically richer. And the biological richness will have enormous unintended benefits. Enormous unintended benefits. Uh, you know, just give you an instance, Sanjay Gubi written very interesting books on Karnataka. And there's a very moving chapter with a hilarious photograph. He was given some international award. He has worked with Karnataka Forest Department over 2,600 square kilometers. They have expanded protected area without displacing a single village of protest because they've sat and made the maps with the Gram Panchayat. They brought them in. Now, this is to the credit of Karnataka government. I mean, I give them all the credit. He has facilitated it. One of those areas, there were four or five hillocks, which they protected with great difficulty. Now, he got it protected because there is a very interesting antelope, four-horned antelope found there. Now, what nobody knew is that there were two, three years of drought. The areas around that had wonderful stream water, while for miles around, there was not a single stream. So when he got the award, it was very embarrassing. They put up a big poster. There is a Chausinga or something which looks like a Chausinga. And there's Gubbi and the two panchayat presidents are tying a Safa, you know, a turban. And he got very upset. But, you know, that is their way of saying that he's our brother and he's worked with us. So I think we have to come up with a very different set of interventions. And the problem with the top down is it will work, but only in certain cases. And in many cases it will work, but in the opposite direction. This is true. I repeat, this is true globally. You can look at China, America, Russia, you find similar cases because it's the same process. And the developmental state of 70s, 80s is very different from the state of 90s post. Because this, this logic that you have to have growth at any cost, irrespective of ideology, once people are in power, they subscribe. This is a problem. I don't know the answer. We can have other talks on it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So I'm afraid that we will not be able to, uh, you know, um, give... Uh, well, there are due place to the questions, but I'm sure that we can have longer conversations after the end of the session. So let me thank again Professor Mahesh Rangarajan and Dr. Divya Banu Singh Chavda for uh, coming today to present and discuss this wonderful work. Before we end the session, I would just like to inform you that our next CSH seminar will take place on the 7th November. We will welcome Dr. Asmita Kabra who will come to speak on, I quote her title, the afterlife of land-based resettlement in the times of truncated agrarian transitions, a study of Adivasi conservation refugees in central India. So thank you again for participating in this session and we will see you next time, hopefully. Thank you.